Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is a reading roundup. But this reading roundup is all about new releases. I have read some advanced copies recently for review and they are all out except for one and one is going to be out really, really soon. So I'm including it in here. Um, so these are all books that I received from NetGalley or Book Sirens to read for review and I want to let you know about them so that you can pick them up yourself if they sound interesting to you. So let's just dive straight in. The first one is The Art of Dying by Ambrose Perry and I'm going to include the picture here. This is the second in a series by Ambrose Perry, and this is the one that's not out yet. It will be out on March the 2nd. And the tagline for this book is, What if death were a sister of mercy? This is the second, as I said, in a series, and I loved the first one. It's set in Edinburgh in the 1800s, so it's a historical mystery. Now, this second one includes the same characters from the first one, um, and it, has, it had an absolutely amazing prologue. I loved the prologue. It was so, so good. It's told in the third person, but there are first person um, narrations interspersed by the killer, um, and so that was, that was really fun, and that prologue is one of those. Um, the book is all about reputation and renown, professional acclaim, and I actually found it a lot darker than the first one. It was very well written. It had amazing historical detail of medicine and the discoveries of the time. Here's a, a great quote. Raven felt a certain disappointment, as he always did, whenever he was forced to confront how much of medicine remained shrouded in mystery. Each feat of progress or discovery was another candle in the dark, but sometimes all they let one see was the vastness of the void. So this is um, a story about medical student um, Raven, Will Raven, and in this book he has now finished his studies and he comes back to Dr. Simpson as, um, as an associate. He uh, is now a, a doctor in Dr. Simpson's practice. Um, he had been studying abroad for a year and when he comes back he finds that there have been changes in Sarah's life as well. Sarah is also a character from the first book. She was a maid in the house. Um, the, the story though, kind of the mystery, is that there has been damage to Simpson's reputation after questions about the death of one of his patients and so both Sarah and Will uh, decide to look into it to see what they can do to recover Dr. Simpson's reputation. Um, this was good, it was well written, but I didn't love it as much as the first one. I gave it three and a half stars and that was because it is much, much darker in tone than the first one. Um, but, but it's still a great series, really, really well written, um, great sense of time and place. Here is another quote for you. There is nothing more dangerous than a woman who has ideas above her station. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was The Art of Dying by Ambrose Perry. Next up, I read The Case of the Catrophil Codicil by P.J. Fitzsimmons, and I'll include a picture here. This is the first anti Beaujolais mystery, and it is a locked room mystery set in 1928, and I loved this one. It was super, super fun. I gave it four stars. Um, it's told in the first person. So there is an impossible murder and an impossible art theft. Um, so everybody's in the room and the lights go out and a painting is stolen, but no one has gone in or out of the room. So how did the painting get stolen? Um, uh, Auntie is called by his friend to come and help because his friend's uncle um, fell out of the window of his tower. His study is in the tower in their family home and he fell out and the door was locked from the inside and no one could figure out um, how he was murdered. Um, and the, the book opens with the telegram that his friend sent to him. He's at his club in London and he receives this telegram. Come at once. Uncle Seb Deb. 
defenestrated by unseen hand fiddles. <laughs> Which is awesome. It is such a good way to open the story. So Fiddles is the name of his friend, his school friend. And so Auntie travels to Canterfell Hall in Sussex to help his, his school friend Fiddles. And it is um, funny. It is witty. It is um, described as PJ, PG Woodhouse meets Agatha Christie. And that's a really apt description. Except I would say, I mean, Agatha Christie's more well known. Um, but John Dixon Carr was much more famous for his locked room mystery. So I would say PG Woodhouse meets uh, John Dixon Carr or Carter Dixon. Uh, he used uh, both of those names. Um, and this was just a really, really fun, fun read. It was a good locked room mystery um, with great characters, um, great dialogue. I just really liked it and I hope there are more that come out in the series. That was one that I read from Book Sirens and The Case of the Canterfell Codicil is available on um, Amazon. Okay, next up I read Death Comes to the Rectory by Catherine Lloyd and I'll put the picture here. This is a series that I have read and really, really enjoy. It's a historical mystery series set in England in the early 1800s, so kind of that late Regency period, um, maybe not even Regency anymore, Georgian, let's say Georgian period. I gave this four and a half stars. It is the eighth in the series and also the final in the series, so I don't want to give too much away about this series if you've never read it, but I highly recommend this series. It's really, really good. Um, so the book opens with preparations for the christening of their daughter Elizabeth and um, Robert's aunt Jane is married to Lucy's father, the rector. So Robert and Lucy are the main characters in this series. So Robert's aunt Jane is married to Lucy's father, who is the rector. Jane's daughter and horrible husband show up unexpectedly and they are not welcomed by anybody. And then the horrible husband is found dead in the rectory study on the day of the christening. Lucy's father becomes the prime suspect because of course this man is dead in his study. Um, and so uh, Robert investigates because he is the magistrate of the area and Lucy investigates because um, she doesn't uh, she she knows that her father is innocent and wants to find the real killer. There is a financial scheme that plays a big part in the plot and I have a bit of a hard time following numbers and money, but it was not bad. It was okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so there was lots of suspects, lots of possible motives, um, some lot, lots of clues, great red herrings. Again, like I said, this is a series that I really, really love and I'm sad that it's over, but I'm also okay. Like an eight book series, I think that's a, gr a great length. Um, so yeah, I gave that one four and a half stars. And then I read The Paris Library by Janet Skeeslin Charles and I'll put the picture here. This is a historical fiction with dual timelines, one set in Paris during World War II and the other set in Montana in the 80s. Um, and this one, um, unfortunately, I wanted to like this one more than I did because it is set in the American Library in Paris during World War II and I felt like there was so much possibility with that and unfortunately, it, I felt like the author missed an opportunity there. Um, so I gave this one three stars. Um, it is a book about Odile, who is um, a resident of Paris. Her father is a police officer in the city um, and she gets a job in the American library in 1939. And then the book follows um, the course of the entire war and then we also follow Lily from Montana. And when the book opens, she's 12 years old. And so we follow her for a few years in the 80s as well in Montana. Although the primary um, time period is Paris in the war. 
Um, there's a great quote from the beginning here. Um, this is Odile. Breathing in the best smell in the world, a melange of the mossy scent of musty books and crisp newspaper pages. I felt as if I'd come home. So one thing that I loved was the setting of the American Library in Paris, and Odile is a book lover, and she is just so, so excited to get a job working in the library. Um, and so I, I wanted more of that. I, that's what I think, where I think the, the author um, missed her chance here is to tell more of the story of what happened in the American Library during Paris. One thing that the, reading this book has made me done, um, has made me do is want to go and research what actually happened in the American Library during the war in Paris, during the occupation, because there are things that happen in the book that I'm pretty sure are, are real. So they do talk about sending donated books to soldiers during the war. They talk about um, the staff of the library delivering books to people who are no longer able to come into the library during the war. They are not allowed to because they are Jewish or part of those groups of people who were, um, uh, who, who were restricted during the war. Um, unfortunately, I didn't really like the characters. So Odile, I wanted to like her because she loved books so much. Um, but I found her a very immature character. For her age, I mean, she. I think she's 20 when the book opens, um, but I just, I found her so very immature. And then there was one scene where um, she's been, like, she's she's kind of cutting a friend because of something that happened, and um, her her boss sends her to volunteer at the hospital for a week um, in order to basically to grow up a bit. And, and then, and so she does, and then, then there's like this instant change in her that that very afternoon she's at the light, at the hospital, she realizes um, how she had been immature and she needs to change. Like, I, I, I mean, yes, she does need to grow up, but I don't really think that kind of instant realization, instant change is, you know, accurate. Um, I think the book also would have been better if the author had just stuck with the Paris timeline. Dual timelines are super popular right now and I feel like maybe she just um, fell into that of, of needing to have a dual timeline. There was really no good reason I felt for that other timeline in Paris, um, I mean sorry, in Montana in the 80s. Um, Odile is a character there, she is, um, you know, older. And in Par um, and had moved to Paris, and so we see her as an older person, which is fine. But Lily, as the the teenager, I just didn't see the need for any of that, and I felt the book would have been better if if there was not that second um, that second timeline. Ultimately, I think the author missed out on the opportunity to tell a really interesting story about the American Library in Paris during World War II. There are some characters that are based on real people that I would have loved to read more about, and so that's why ultimately I gave it three stars. Next I read Death at One Blow by Henrietta Hamilton, and I'll put the picture in here. This is the second in her Sally and Johnny Heldar series. And it is actually part of the Agora Books Uncrowned Queens of Crime series. I love that publishers are bringing back um, forgotten books um, from the kind of the golden age um, or even um, a little further along. So this book was originally published in 1957 and Agora Books is uh, now just putting, um, putting them out again. Um, uh, John, Johnny and Sally Heldare are antiquarian booksellers in London, which is awesome. But in this book, they leave London for the countryside. Sir Mark Mercator has asked them to sort out two jumbled collections in his newly acquired estate, Westwater Manor. Um, and then there is an accident, and then a murder, and then another death. And I really enjoyed this one. I gave it four stars. It was a great mystery. They were amateur sleuths, um, but not 
they didn't have any of the annoying qualities that I can sometimes find in, in amateur sleuths. There was a small number of suspects, an intelligent inspector, so it's not like they were up against the bumbling detective from Scotland Yard, which I don't always like. Um, people tended to confide in Sally and Johnny. They were there, they're witnesses, and so they got information because people tended to confide in them. There were some great red herrings in this story. Um, and then also there was a lot about the repercussions of the war even 12 years later. So yeah, I would highly recommend them. If you can get a hold of these um, um, Henrietta Hamilton books, I think there were only four in the series. I'm going to go and try and find and get a hold of the others in this series as well because they were really, really good. And then I read A History, and this is The Suffragette Bombers by Simon Webb. And I'll put the picture here. This, was, this is put out by Pen and Sword, and uh, the tagline is Britain's Forgotten Terrorists. And so this one intrigued me. The, the title and the tagline intrigued me. So Simon Webb's thesis for this book is, in addition to their legitimate political activity and more boisterous protests, they also conducted a widespread and sustained bombing campaign against targets throughout the entire countryside. And then a little later in the introduction, he also says, while looking at the violent activities of the suffragette movement, we shall also be exploring the thesis that they did more harm than good to the cause of women gaining the parliamentary vote. So this is a story, he calls it the suffragette bombers, but he is really looking at a small group within the women's social and political union and the, the, the sustained um, campaign, bombing campaign that, that they participated in. And so I thought it was really interesting. Um, he really did um, encourage us to rethink our understanding of the suffragettes and what really happened in that time period. Now, um, he, uh, he did a good job of outlining the differences between suffragists and suffragettes, which I think is really helpful. Suffragists, suffragists, are those agitating for political reform which would enable women to vote in parliamentary elections and suffragists used lawful and constitutional methods. Suffragettes were initially a diminutive term for direct action and immediate change and then basically they became, suffragettes became the, the women out of the, basically out of the Women's Social and Political Union. Um, he also did a really good job of highlighting the difference between equal suffrage and universal suffrage. Um, universal suffrage is what the suffragists were calling for. Equal suffrage is what the suffragettes were calling for. And that was a very um, interesting difference between the two. Um, so for example, the women's social and political union are not asking for a vote for every woman. That is from um, the outline of the, their aims included in all of their publications. And so they were not actually calling for universal suffrage. They were calling for equal suffrage. Um, so that was really, really interesting. My, my big problem with this book um, was that, um, that he did not, he wasn't consistent in his use of citations. I felt ultimately that the authority of his argument suffered from inconsistent scholarship. So for example, um, he gives a quote um, on page 119 um, from the, vote, the Votes for Women, which was a publication put out by the WPCU, the, <laughs> the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU, um, but he does not give any um, specific information about the edition uh, or when that publication came out. He just said it was in the Votes for Women. And then later on, on the very same page, he quotes Christabel Parkhurst writing in The Suffragette from the 29th of May, 1914. So that's an example of the inconsistency of his citation. I found that he um, often didn't, it, he di often didn't include any um, 
citation information he would just quote and give a very vague reference for what it was from. So for example, he quotes Christabel Pankhurst in the second paragraph on page um, 20, but then he gave no source information for that whatsoever. And then he, there was also no end notes or footnotes. There is a bibliography and there is an index, which is great, but I feel like he loses a lot of his authority by not including um, end notes or footnotes or citations for where he gets his information from. Um, I, but I did learn a lot of interesting things. So I learned about the great unrest of 1911. Um, so he, he included what was going on at the time that may have been pulling the attention of those in power in parliament from the question of suffrage for women. Um, the great unrest in 1911, um, there were almost a million people on strike, on a widespread strike throughout the country. During the summer, almost 12,000 soldiers were quartered in London to address the strikes and the protests. And there was fierce rioting. I didn't know um, about that. I hadn't heard about that before. Um, and so, I understand why he calls the book The Suffragette Bombers, but I really feel like um, he is um, he is really just addressing a, a small group within the Women's Social and Political Union. Uh, and yes, they were suffragettes, but not all suffragettes were involved in the in the bombing campaign. Um, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, I feel, is an organization that deserves a lot more recognition. We hear a lot about the Women's Political and Social Union, but this one, um, I feel like we need to hear more about. Um, it was founded in 1897, and by 1914, it had over 50,000 um, members. The WSPU had between 3,000 and 5,000 members in 1914. Um, and basically, the WSPU was entirely bound up in the personalities and characters of the, the Parkhursts. And I think because of their bombing campaigns and um, the hunger strikes and all of that, they get far more attention than the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. Um, uh, here was a quote that I um, that I that I liked. For every militant suffragette fighting for the vote by means of violence and disorder, there were at least ten or twenty moderate suffragists working peacefully and constitutionally toward the same end. So I did think that um, this book challenges long-held beliefs about the suffragettes. Um, obviously, he is talking about militant suffragettes in this. Um, book and here's another quote from page 121. The entire movement was being tainted by the mad actions of a handful of fanatics. So it's definitely an interesting read if you want to learn more about suffragists and suffragettes and what else was going on at that time period. Definitely give it a go. Um, and so yeah, that's all for me for today. Those are the six books that I've read recently for review. Have you read any of these books? Do any of these books sound interesting to you? Let's chat about them in the comment section down below. And I will see you for another video soon. Bye.